just a quick note as well. Thank you to Aberystwyth and Queen's University Green Fund for allowing us to use their Zoom license um, throughout this missed seminar series. Um, okay, so I think we can get started on our seminar now. So we're um, very pleased to welcome Dr. Imogen Jinjal here today. Um, Imogen is a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Southampton, and she's previously held research positions at um, a number of places, the University of Warwick, Queen Mary University of London, as well as Imperial College London. So today Imogen's going to um, take us through the physics behind collisionless shock waves in the context of Earth's bow shock. Um, as well as showing us some exciting results from both simulations and high resolution in situ measurements. So I'll hand it over to you, Imogen. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess first I'll start by, well, with a couple of rounds of thank yous. First to Miss Council for inviting me to give the seminar. Um, and second to my long list of collaborators, um, down here, either who've worked on me on the projects closely or through um, some of the instruments and simulations that um, I'm going to show off uh, during this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk from a fairly top-down perspective. Um, I'm going to start with just some of the definitions of shocks and collisionless shocks specifically. Um, I'm going to talk about where we find them um, from far out in you know astrophysical context to closer to home. Um, and then about how we're actually doing the science in terms of missions or simulations, um, and then talk about some of the key challenges, the things we're looking for, um, the key structures specifically in the bow shock itself, um, and then go through some of the key concepts uh, as far as the science is concerned and recent results. Um, as a, a sort of a quick tour of a review of the, the, the shock physics over the last few years. Um, so let's start with uh, this image on the right here, because this is what most people think of when we think about shocks. Um, so here is the vapor cone behind a shock wave created by a super jet. Um, so the shock wave is this transition here. Um, you might also have come across them in atmospheric contexts from explosions, from blast waves, um, although I won't include a picture of one of those because the context is rather grim in comparison. Um, so what is the shock layer itself? Um, it is this propagating structure that is um, a transition between uh, something moving supersonic and something moving subsonic. So um, require the, the shock wave itself to move uh, faster than the local wave speed through the medium. Um, that wave speed will be the sound speed if you're in the atmosphere or in um, space physics context, that'll be the magnetosonic speed or the offense speed. Um, and this transition is characterized, uh, well, that it's sharp. Uh, it takes you through from supersonic to subsonic speeds or superphonic, subalphonic, and so on. Um, you'll have a sharp change in the pressure, the temperature, the density, and if you're in a plasma, the magnetic field strength. So it's often thought of as a discontinuity, um, at least at, at, at most kind of global scales and especially atmosphere, atmospheric scales. So see the thermal component of the velocity change from very high to very low across the shock. Um, the temperature will go up, the density will go up, magnetic field strength if you're in a plasma will also go up. So I kind of showed you that picture of the jet um, in, in the outline slide. Um, and I want to make clear that uh, although there's a sort of universal, universality of practice here, the conditions between shock waves in the atmosphere and shock waves in space are very different. Um, and crucially, the, the concept we're, we're considering that makes these so different is collisionality. Um, also electromagnetic fields, but collisionality mainly um, in the sense that if we look at these parameters in an Earth's atmosphere, the mean free path between particle collisions um, is on the order of 10 microns with a time scale of about 10 nanoseconds. Um, 
even on the time scales relating to supersonic uh, jets or explosions, that's very small. Um, whereas if we look at the solar wind at 1 AU in our local neighborhood, the mean path of the plasma is about 1 AU. Um, and the currents. So it's entirely possible that at least at 1 AU, a particle will have not collided with another for you know the span of the entire solar system. That's probably not strictly true because these conditions change and these time scales uh, are shorter and the length scales shorter um, nearer the sun in the inner heliosphere. But as a general rule, we can consider that waves in space are collisionless. So they're not mediated at all by collisions. And that sort of introduces the first problem because in an atmospheric context for our jets or for our explosions, um, the gas is slow to subsonic speeds and heated by particle collisions, um, uh, the, the viscosity of the gas. Um, so in collisionless shock waves, we instead have to find another way to, to slow and heat the plasma. And um, so to look for the various kinds of nonlinear electromagnetic plasma interactions that are gonna replace that, uh, that viscosity of the gas. So that's the first big question. And the second is, well, where do we see them? Um, what, what is the astrophysical context here? Um, and some of the, the, the highest profile, I suppose, or prettiest uh, images of shockwaves we have come from astrophysical contexts. Um, so on the left here, we have images of shockwaves in a black hole jet. Um, so this is the, the plasma being ejected from the poles of the black hole at um, strongly relativistic speeds. Um, and here is an image, just a single image actually from an animation that you can see in this paper, um, this nature paper by Meyer et al. Uh, which shows bright inside the jet consistent with the shock waves moving and colliding with each other through that jet. Um, on the right here is um, an image of a supernova remnant. So this is SN1572 and uh, X-ray observations from the, the Chandra Space Telescope are shown um, in purple overlaid on here. And we can see a wave in Chandra on the very edge of this, this blast wave from this supernova remnant. Um, and those X-rays are released by synchrotron radiation of the high energy electrons accelerated by that shock wave. So if we start bringing this a little closer to home, uh, we can look at the termination shock. So now we're looking at heliospheric contexts, contexts. So within our solar system or at the edges of our solar system, uh, we have a termination shock and this termination shock is where the solar wind itself, as it's expanding into interstellar space, uh, transitions from being a supersonic flow to a subsonic flow. Um, as we transition uh, from the solar wind um, unshocked into the helio sheath, and then eventually you'll cross the helio into the interstellar medium. Um, it's a fun experiment you can do at home to have a look at one of these termination shocks. Um, it's directly now analogous to this image uh, posted on the, the right. Um, doesn't need any attribution because I took this photo of my own sink um, yesterday. <laughs> um, but here you can see if you, um, in your kitchen sink, if you let your tap run, um, you have a source of water hitting your sink. It runs along the bottom of the sink um, at supersonic speeds. And this is supersonic in the context of gravity waves on the surface of the water. Um, as it slows, you eventually have this layer here, which is or a shock wave, a termination shock, um, behind which the water is slowed and it's all uh, turbulent and disordered fluctuations. So that's what's happening in the sun as well. Uh, we can bring that even closer to home still, and we can start thinking about the interplanetary medium, in which case we're looking at interplanetary shocks. And these come in two main flavors. Um, uh, there, there are shocks associated with uh, co-rotating interaction regions. So these are the boundary layers between fast outflowing solar wind and fast outflowing solar winds. Um, 
this drives uh, reverse shock on the leading edge of the, the fast wind and uh, reverse shock moving backwards um, along the, the, the other end of the, the, the CIR. Um, the other uh, possibly uh, dream of the coronal mass ejections. So when the sun releases a huge um, uh, mass ejection, they're well named. <laughs> um, this can drive a shockwave ahead of the CME um, with particle acceleration and cause space weather effects as I think most people in the room are uh, <laughs> well versed in. Um, so bring it, a, bring it closer to home yet again, and we start looking at bow shocks. Um, so a bow shock is a kind of shock wave you generate when you have an obstacle moving faster than the wave speed through a medium. Um, equivalently, in the other frame of reference, you can have a flow moving over an obstacle at faster than the wave speed. Um, so the atmospheric uh, analogy here is to what's well, like the jet I showed in the outline slide or a supersonic bullet um, like this, this shadowgram shown here. See the shock wave on the leading edge, um, this kind of hyperbola shape, this curved shape on the front, standing off from the front of the bullet. Um, the bullet also has several other shocks trailing behind, geometric effects and so on. Um, but in the moving through this all winds, uh, faster than the magnetosonic speed. So we drive this bow shock, which um, from the magnetopause. Um, okay. So it's not just a magnetospheric thing. Um, it is a heliospheric thing as well. Um, and so here is a, a Hubble image in visible light of the star LL Orionis which has a very well resolved uh, bow shock ahead of it as it moves through the interstellar medium. Um, our sun probably doesn't have a bow shock as it moves, moves through the, uh, heli uh, the interstellar medium. Um, it's moving a little too slowly, or at least that's what uh, the most recent IBEX um, observations are saying. Um, however, all of the planets uh, in our in our solar system are driving bow shocks ahead of them. Um, so it's not purely an Earth phenomenon, but Earth is the best laboratory we have for seeing how they work. Um, so how do we see how they work? <laughs> um, obviously, the best way we can we can determine what these electromagnetic processes uh, driving the shock. Um, or behind the shock processes are, is by in situ in, in observation. And that requires um, spacecraft. <laughs> um, so the bow shock, at least Earth's bow shock, has been observed for, for many, many decades, uh, way early into the, uh, the, the space age during the Explorer program. Um, but I want to focus here on the sort of the last 20 years or so um, of missions that I think have been sort of most important to, to in-situ observations of shocks. And this isn't an uh, exhaustive list. Um, there have been so many more um, uh, other spacecraft that have been useful, but, but these are, I think, the highlights and some of the ones I'm going to be referencing in the, the, the slides to come. We have Cluster, of course, um, which was launched uh, 20 years ago as a multi-spacecraft mission um, in a close formation of, um, on the order of hundreds of kilometers. Um, so because uh, Cluster had this uh, relatively at the time short um, spacecraft separation, um, you could do uh, multi-spacecraft needs techniques, which can help you um, sort of rebuild the three-dimensional structure uh, of the shockwave, or at least some of it. Um, Themis came a little later. Themis has even wider spacing. It was looking more at uh, sort of global effects uh, with respect to the magnetosphere. But when it's on the day side, you can look at the, the global effects of the, the shock as well. So you can observe the shock and um, its effects on the magnetosphere and even deeper into the magnetopause. Um, up to 2015, we get the, the sort of the best mission we've had so far for observing microprocesses inside shock waves. 
and that's magnetospheric multiscale, which like cluster is a close formation of a spacecraft, um, a four spacecraft in a tetrahedron, but with spacecraft separations on the order of 10 kilometers, maybe even less. Um, so you can really see uh, ion and even electron scale kinetic physics with the mass. Um, more recently, in the last couple of years, we've had Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, which I include here because they're going to be very important for looking at uh, especially interplanetary shocks um, in the coming years. Um, so definitely a watch the space on these two missions. Um, of course, we also have simulations. Um, simulations are enormously uh, useful in supporting the findings of these in situ missions. Um, they can come in all kinds of flavors. You can use MHD sim simulations um, and some hybrid simulations to look at global effects, or you might use um, high resolution PIC simulations um, to, to view the full kinetic physics. And when you're doing those, uh, those, those full PIC or hybrid simulations on very local scales, so you don't worry about the global structure, um, it can look something like this. Uh, where you have a sort of a 2D or 3D box, you drive an inflow inside it that reflects off a boundary on the other side, driving the shock, um, in this case, in the negative X direction. Actions to do all kinds of things like follow particle trajectories, um, look at uh, uh, kinetic scale instabilities and so on. So um, the sort of the interplay between these two things in situ observations and simulations is extremely important. So what are the main challenges when we're looking at shock physics? Um, as I said, we want to know what electromagnetic processes are responsible for slowing and heating the plasma. Um, and that sort of feeds into this, this first main challenge at the top here in red, which is um, how are particles accelerated and heated in the shock transition? And that doesn't necessarily just include the heating um, that we observe in the magneto sheath, um, but also high energy particle acceleration, whether we're thinking about galactic cosmic rays or um, uh, solar energetic particles. Um, second is what is the kinetic scale structure of the shock layer? So it's not a discontinuity. Um, even though it seems like that way at large scales, of course, you can always look at look at smaller and smaller scales. And as we have access to higher cadence um, spacecraft observations and higher resolution simulations, um, we can really probe this, this kinetic structure and how it's time dependent. Um, these two questions funnel into one of the uh, areas I'm most interested in at the moment, which is magnetic region as kind of a merger between these two things. So that's um, how is uh, magnetic reconnection uh, occurring by what instabilities uh, in, in the shock layer at kinetic scales and can that contribute to, to heating and acceleration. So I'll talk a bit of, uh, more about that um, at this a uh, little later in the talk. Finally, want to know about the global structure of the shock wave. Um, so that can be how it responds to transient solar wind phenomenon, questions of space weather and things like that, and how it can couple to the uh, magnetopause and deeper into the magnetosphere. So I'm going to give a few examples of some of the physics uh, or recent um, results related to each of these three areas. I'm going to keep this color coding. So <laughs> if it's got red at the top, it's to do with uh, particle acceleration and so on. If it's yellow at the top, global structure, but um, I hope that'll be fairly clear anyway. So um, let's start by looking at some of the key structure involved in the shock wave, um, especially in the bow shock. Um, and when we're considering the physics here, uh, we need to pay close attention to the orientation of the shock wave. Um, so this is whether the shock wave is quasi-perpendicular, um, in which case the sh shock N is uh, nearly or approximately perpendicular to the bow shock. So if we have a platoon like this with the IMF like the perpendicular shock. Um, likewise, here we have the quasi-parallel shock where the normal is, is roughly parallel to the IMF, um, 
And these two regions are rather different, as I'll show over the next two slides. Um, so let's start with quasi-perpendicular shock. Um, here is sort of the simplest cartoon on the left here of what the quasi-perpendicular shock should look like um, if you're going to say the magnetic field strength. And this is where it looks most like the discontinuities I was showing in the very early slides. Um, so we have solar wind with a low magnetic field strength. There's a little foot where it's, you start to see some of the kinetic effects. It very suddenly rises into a ramp um, up to a maximum. It's an overshoot and then kind of oscillates as we reach a more um, stable magneto sheath value. Um, this is what it looks like in MMS data. So this is the magnetic field from a shock crossing observed by MMS um, all the way back in 2015. And here are those same read enabled. So this is over about 30 seconds of data. Um, and you can see the sun here on the left, there is the shock ramp here, the overshoot and some oscillation into the sheath. Um, roughly speaking, this is, I've color coded these regions in the same way. Uh, the foot maybe extends a little further in. Um, it can be quite hard to say what is really the ramp, especially at these, these resolutions. Um, so what is the kinetic process that is behind uh, that shock structure, this foot ramp overshoot structure? Um, and one of the most important kinetic processes as far as quasi-perpendicular shocks are concerned is ion reflection. Um, so this is a process where some portion of the ions can be specularly reflected from the shock ramp. Uh, given that you have a very high um, or sharp change in the magnetic field, they can just bounce off. Um, so here's a comparison of what the trajectories might look like for a transmitted ion through the shock and for a reflected ion in red. So the reflected ion has its um, uh, normal component of its velocity flipped. Um, so it moves, uh, then gyrates back upstream uh, with this trajectory, turns around because of its gyration, accelerated by the motion electric field, encounters the shock again, and, and sound stream may bounce again. Um, so this is a process by which you can sort of turn this flow energy into perpendicular energy of your ions, thereby causing them to heat. Um, so this is one of the, the, the best heating mechanisms for shock waves. Um, now this gyration of these ions as they bounce off this, uh, this, this shock surface sort of defines the foot. So this is where you start seeing the kinetic processes. You're starting to see gyration of ions um, uh, in that, that blue foot region. And here are some observations from MMS from uh, uh, Yolanda et al. 2016 which show that process happening as you step through the shockwave. Um, so this first, these first panels here um, are in the solar wind and this is the solar wind beam. As you just touch the foot here in panel two, you can see that there is a reflected population of ions um, here along with the solar wind. Um, and then you get deeper into the ramp, you see that this particle um, these reflected particles are showing signs of gyration um, as they move around this, this um, uh, single energy tour in, in this, uh, for, the, for the gyration, yeah. Um, so recently, this is, I guess, one of the first most recent results, this uh, reflection process has also been observed at interplanetary shocks, which had previously been quite difficult because um, the resolution to be able to spot, um, you need quite high time cadence to be able to spot the process happening in full. Um, for example, cluster orthemis might have only gotten one, two or three um, measurements of the ion distribution across a similar shock. So that's quasi-perpendicular shocks. Um, and one of the key differences between quasi-perpendicular and quasi-parallel shocks is what's going to happen to these reflected ions. So if you reflect an ion under quasi-parallel shock, um, the gyration of the particle um, as it's moving back upstream will not intersect with the shock a second time. The particle move upstream 
Uh, so you get a backstreaming particle, a backstreaming population of particles moving ahead of the shock upstream. And this can drive uh, stream instabilities and other instabilities in the upstream region. It can drive waves, um, which create a sort of unstable um, foreshock uh, filled with fluctuations and non-stationary structure. Um, so this is the cartoon showing that often I've added a foreshock on here, where on the quasi-parallel side, you get fluctuations and backstreaming particles. Um, this means that the structure of the quasi-parallel shock is um, extremely, what's the word, disordered, I suppose, turbulent, um, with, a, with an asterisk on the word turbulence. Um, here is a, it's an off-shared picture of uh, what a two-dimensional look at the magnetic field strength in a, in a quasi-parallel sh shock might look like. Um, as Schwarzenberg just called it, it's a, it's a patchwork of 3D structures um, with, with sharp um, magnetic structures called short large amplitude magnetic structures, or SLAMs for short. Um, you can also drive chocolates, um, ULF waves, ultra-low frequency waves, and, and several other processes. Um, so when you look at a quasi-parallel shock in the data, and this is uh, the magnetic field at the top and an ion spectrogram, uh, energy spectrogram on the bottom, you can see that this quasi-parallel shock is far from simple, far from a plane of discontinuity. It's messy, it's interesting, and it's getting a lot of attention, I suppose. It always has. Um, so I suppose that's the key takeaway for quasi-parallel shocks to remember is that they're, they're more difficult. <laughs> um, so that's a bit about the ions. And next, I'll just briefly talk about what the electrons do. Um, so for the electrons, the thermal speed is much, much higher than the flow speed. So in the solar wind, you'll start with a, an electron distribution that looks something like this in red. Um, where you have something that looks sort of Maxwellian towards the low energies with heavy tail um, towards the high energies. Um, as the, the electrons cross the shock, they're accelerated by the potential inside the shock, which pushes this, um, this, this peak in the electrons um, towards the, the downstream direction. Um, meanwhile, the, the negative direction um, is sort of filled in by backscattering and uh, instabilities and wave particle interactions until you eventually end up with this flat top distribution in the magneto sheath just behind the shock um, where you have these heavy power law tails and then this, well, yeah, as we said, flat top uh, distribution. So here's what this looks like in the data from this 20, 2018 paper by Chen et al. Um, uh, and you can see these are some 2D distributions of the um, uh, electron distribution in, in parallel and perp, or one of the perp directions, um, changing as we travel through the shock ramp here. So this is the temperature and the electric fields um, in the bottom two panels. And you can see, as I described, the sort of the, the, the peak um, sort of moves towards the upstream, uh, sorry, downstream side. Um, the distribution is widened and flattened. Actually, you end up with this flat top distribution. Um, of course, the, 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 the real process is a little more complicated. Um, and especially as this, the, the recent result from this paper itself shows um, that this process isn't just occurring very gradually over a shock ramp, but it's actually strongly associated as well with very sharp spikes in the electric field, um, even upstream of the power shock slightly. So um, there's far more to learn yet about electron acceleration. And I'll briefly mention shock, uh, diffusive shock acceleration as well, um, because this is a process that's particularly important for um, shocks ahead of CMEs and for galactic cosmic rays. And this is the idea that uh, the, you can trigger a Fermi acceleration process with the shock wave whereby fluctuations on the downstream and upstream side can cause your particles to sort of bounce back and forth between the shock wave. 
encountering it multiple times, accelerating a little bit more each time. Um, and eventually you can, you can drive these particles or some portion of these particles up to extremely high energies. And that leads to something that's called the injection problem in shock physics, um, which uh, is sort of a two-parter. The first is, um, what is the energy threshold required to, um, to kick off this diffusive shock acceleration process for any given um, uh, population of particles, whether it's your electrons or your ions or so on. Um, second is, uh, it's not always obvious how some of those populations of particles even get to that superthermal energy threshold. Um, so as we move into the next uh, few slides, bear in mind that we're always looking for a new acceleration mechanisms um, to, to, to sort of kickstart this process. And that's where something like uh, non-stationarity comes in. Um, and this is where I hope my video works. <laughs> Um, so non-stationarity, um, especially with respect to kinetic structures, um, is the idea that uh, the shock wave itself is strongly time dependent, um, especially on ion kinetic scales. Um, and I'll show this video now and hope my connection is stable enough to show it happening. So here is a hybrid simulation of a shock layer. Um, so this is only a few ion inertial lengths across. And you can see that um, this is uh, both strongly time dependent, it's filled with waves. Um, on the left, fairly quiet. You can waves growing in uh, reconnection at the press of these waves, forming a briefly transition region in which uh, 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 convex downstream. You even start to reform the new shock ramp several times ahead of the, the shock. Um, so all of these complex processes can be involved in particle acceleration. Um, and part of the, the, the recent shock physics is trying to, to characterize those. Um, so I'll take you through some examples of non-stationarity in shocks, um, especially some of those that have been able to be uh, observed by um, spacecraft recently. Um, so one is uh, surface ripples. So that's the idea that on the, the shock surface, sort of attached to the shock ramp, um, you can drive surface waves which propagate tangentially across the shock. So the last cartoon on here, um, you have these ripples moving uh, along this tangential direction. So these were first reported way back in in in. Uh, uh, or at least first observed by cluster way back in 2006 um, after a, a sort of a serendipitous, very slow crossing of the bow shock by cluster. Um, they've also been seen in, in many simulations since, um, and they were observed first uh, in MMS in high resolution by Yolanda et al. 2016. Um, so these are generally associated with quasi perpendicular shocks. Um, but it is possible that parallel shocks um, generate them as well, particularly when non-stationary effects cause them to be temporarily quasi-perpendicular. Um, so this is what a uh, ripple looks like in the data. Um, so these are some, some results from uh, magnetospheric multiscale from Yolanda Tal 2016, uh, where we have the magnetic and electric fields and distributions of the um, ion velocities in a normal direction. So you can see in these, the, these spot panels here, you have a solar wind beam coming in towards the shock at minus 500 kilometers per second. You reach a foot about here and start seeing reflected ions. But then you see these face space holes a little deeper down where we're sort of cresting these ripples. And you can use the MMS's multi spacecraft methods and timing analyses and so on to reconstruct what that ripple must look like. And you can see this sort of uh, this ripple structure in the cartoon up here. So that's ripples. Um, I'm also going to talk for a few slides actually about magnetic reconnection, which is something I've been very interested in over the last few years. Um, so this was first uh, sort of discovered happening in simulations. Um, we have the Matsumoto paper et al. from 2015 uh, in Science, um, which showed for a 
fully kinetic, full pick simulation, you could generate uh, magnetic islands and current sheets on filaments caused by the iron viable instability. Um, later in my 2017 paper, we showed that in a hybrid simulation, you could drive um, sort of a turbulent transition region inside the shock um, of a quasi-parallel shock, um, which has like this and sort of magnetic islands like this embedded very briefly in the shock layer. Uh, which begs the question, um, if we're seeing them so much in the simulations, can we spot them in the data? And the answer to that came in 2018, which was yes. <laughs> um, so we had a couple of case study papers, one by me uh, in 2019, another by Shan Wang, also in 2019, which showed that uh, sheets with signatures of reconnection were visible inside the, the shock transition lane. Um, so here is one of those examples. Um, uh, we have a quasi-parallel shock here uh, with this transition region just behind the shock ramp, which occurs about here. Um, and you can see we have a field reversal current here with, if you squint, um, an electron jet with some associated electron heating. Um, so this was a way apparently to drive electron acceleration um, inside the shock transition layer um, or slightly downstream of it in this case. So the question then turned to, well, how common is magnetic reconnection in shock waves? Um, which called for a survey. Um, so in uh, 2019, mostly, um, I trolled through the, almost the entire MMS catalog uh, of shock waves looking for signatures of uh, magnetic reconnection. Um, and I collected all the st statistics I could of those reconnection sites. Um, to draw diagrams of sort of probability distribution functions like uh, on, on the right here. Um, so this is the, 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 the sort of the distribution of shock parameters served by MMS in the survey. And then in red is the distribution of shock parameters where at least uh, one reconnection site was observed in those shocks. And what we found out the ratio of these two um, was that shock reconnection appeared to be a universal process. So all shocks can exhibit re reconnection, um, although it's maybe slightly more common in quasi-parallel shocks and slightly more common in high Mach number shocks. And that was slightly surprising because with, I thought it would be a lot more common in parallel shocks than it turned out to be. Um, or rather I should say it was more common in uh, perpendicular shocks than I was expecting. I was expecting to see almost none. Um, so the question which still remains here is, okay, we see a lot of reconnection sites, but are they a significant factor in uh, sort of the, the, the global energetics um, of the shock wave? Um, and that's a question that uh, is ongoing, although we do have some, some recent very nice results uh, cooking, um, which hopefully we'll start to see light soon. So watch the space on that. So that's non-stationarity. And before I close, I just want to uh, do a, a quick sort of um, global look at some of the, the structures associated with shock waves and um, some recent results and what they look like in the data. So I'm just going to show off these three global effects um, caused uh, in the first two cases by solar wind transients and second more just uh, based on stirring by the foreshock. Um, so a hot flow anomaly um, is what you get when a tangential discontinuity in the interplanetary magnetic field um, intersects with the bow shock. Um, so these have been known about for quite some time now, so the discovery isn't new. Um, these go far, far back as the 80s. Um, but MMS, typically, you can probably see a theme here, um, has allowed us to, to sort of probe uh, the, the, the internals of a hot flow anomaly at much higher resolution than ever before. Um, and to see how kinetic processes are, are driving various things at, at HFAs. Um, so hot flow anomaly um, showing um, all the sort of uh, guts of it, uh, as observed by uh, MMS, was in the Schwartz 2018 paper. Um, 
and the reason for that is shown here. So this is what a hot flow anomaly looks like. Um, it looks like a sort of cavity in the um, uh, solar wind. So the, the MMS sort of crosses from the solar wind here. Um, these are the ion energies. Um, sees this low density, hot region in the middle, um, and then back out into the solar wind again. Um, it has compressional boundaries on either side, so a, a, a magnetic field and density increase on either side with sort of a void in the middle. So what's happening here is that when the tangential discontinuity um, intersects with the bow shock, um, it can channel uh, reflected particles upstream along the discontinuity, which sort of opens up the magneto sheath into the, the, the current sheet and the tangential discontinuity, um, expanding uh, the, the magneto sheath out like this in this kind of triangular structure where you see sort of compressional boundaries on either side. Um, so that's HFAs. Um, next we have four shock bubbles, which um, look extremely similar to hot flow anomalies, um, uh, except there are a few important uh, subtle differences in the observations, which lead you to a, a very different conclusion about what the global structure looks like. So a foreshock bubble is something that happens just upstream of the shock in the foreshock where all these backstreaming particles are, are, are sort of um, dominating the physics. Um, and when a rotational discontinuity in the solar wind interacts with the foreshock, um, you can drive an expansion behind the uh, rotational discontinuity like this. Um, itself drives the shock uh, along with single compressed boundary um, just ahead of the bow shock. Um, so here's what that in the MMS data is reported very recently um, in 2020. Um, you have, again, solar wind beams on either side, low field. Uh, with a compressional boundary on this side here um, and a sort of a low density expansion region in the middle. Um, we know that these foreshock bubbles can be sites of, of particle acceleration, for example, by uh, particles bouncing between the foreshock shock and the bow shock and by a Fermi process. Um, and second, just by reconnection being driven inside the, the bubble's core. Finally, we have um, magneto sheath jets, which are a phenomenon where rapid, where you can drive rapid inflow of plasma from the foreshock into the magneto sheath um, from the bow shock, starting at the bow shock. Um, so this cartoon we produced from uh, Plash Guitar 2018 shows what those look like. Um, these, these jets into the magneto sheath are, are global structures. They can span the full width of the magneto sheath, um, uh, seeded at, say, uh, large scale ripples or ULF waves. Um, these themselves can drive bow waves in the magneto sheath, which can act as sites of um, a particle acceleration and reconnection. They can impact the magnetopause, causing uh, triggering reconnection there, which obviously can then have. Um, uh, effects you can measure all the way at the ground. Um, so that's the three global effects that I'm going to discuss. Um, and I guess I just move on to my conclusions, which I suppose is less about conclusions, but more about summarizing the big picture. Um, so sort of the, the, the overarching question of the collision of shock physics is, how do nonlinear electromagnetic processes um, replace particle collisions um, in space. Um, which are kind of subdivided into these three main questions. One, how are particles accelerated or heated? So that could be things like um, ion reflection. It could be things like uh, acceleration by the shock potential. Um, it could be trapping um, in shock structures, um, reconnection, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, what is the kinetic scale structure of the shock layer and how is it time dependent? So that covers things like ripples, uh, cyclic reformation, which sadly I haven't had time to talk much about. 
um, or again, magnetic reconnection or generation of a turbulent transition layer. Um, other instabilities um, like iron vibral instabilities and so on can also uh, cause non-stationarity. Um, and then finally, what's the global structure? Um, hot flow anomalies, um, uh, foreshock bubbles, magnetosheath jets and more. This is just a few of the, the, the sort of the, the structures in the family of things of, of when we ask our question, what is the global implications of um, structure of the shock? Um, so come talk to me mostly, I suppose, if, if you're interested about doing in situ shock physics um, or especially hybrid kinetic simulations or magnetic reconnections. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. And I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen. That was um, really interesting. And you um, went through everything really clearly. So that's really useful for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now we'll move on to the question time. So if you do have a question, um, could you just um, use the hands up function or alternatively um, put it in the chat and we can ask Imogen there. Um, so yeah, anyone got any questions? Um, whilst I wait for people to type and stuff, um, I had a quick question. So. Um, it seems like these quasi parallel shocks are really complex and really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think I saw from your long term survey that perhaps um, the quasi perpendicular shocks are slightly um, higher occurrence probability. And I was just curious, I mean, maybe I interpreted the plot wrong, but I was curious what sort of controls the long-term occurrence of quasi-perpendicular compared to quasi-parallel and are one more likely than the other to occur? Um, so in theory, you, ha you should have as much quasi-parallel as quasi-perpendicular shock on, at any given time. Um, it's essentially just this boundary between 45 degrees and, and 90 degrees or zero degrees. Um, so there will be some um, point on the bow shock that is always quasi-parallel and some point that is always quasi-perpendicular. Um, so when you see effects like this, which is, which is more about, um, uh, I guess you, get, you, can, you can see this trend towards having maybe a few more perpendiculars um, is more about selection effects than, than otherwise. Um, um, possibly, I mean, in the sense that um, as well, getting a, a sort of exactly zero degree parallel shock requires quite a specific crossing of MMS. Um, coupled with the fact that it can be a bit more difficult to measure the um, theta BM, the orientation of a quasi-parallel shock than a quasi-perpendicular shock, mm -hmm. tends to push um, these bars upwards, relatively speaking, um, because they're easier, <laughs> I suppose. But it's not necessarily, and it shouldn't be because quasi-perpendicular shocks are more common at the bow shock. On the other hand, most interplanetary shocks and um, astrophysical shocks are going to be um, quasi-perpendicular because of the nature of the, the sort of the geometry of how they work. Um, Thank you yeah. for explaining that to me. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, we've got one here in the chat from Martin Archer. He says, nice talk. Did you use the global scale normal from a model Thanks. shock for theta BN in your reconnection survey? Could the local scale theta BN using a measured normal from MMS also play a role? Yes, absolutely. So um, if, if you dive into this paper, Chinjil 2020, you'll see that we tried both methods. Um, so we go through a shock model and uh, the local time, you know, using the, the tetrahedron to measure the shock orientation. Um, ultimately, we decided that at least for this particular study, the model was more reliable. And that's only because um, when you're looking at this, this the scale length of magnetospheric multiscale, where the spacecraft separation is on the order of a few kilometers, um, 
structures like ripples or shock reformation or any of the, the kinetic scale non-stationarity effects can cause localized deviations of the shock normal. Um, so as you cross through your shock, you can see that, that the shock normal wobbling back and forth like this um, as you cross ripples and so on. So it doesn't necessarily give you a good sort of global context of, of the shock normal. Um, so that, that's one way, I guess that's a good example of where MMS's um, sort of uh, close tetrahedral formation is not necessarily an advantage um, because it really is only giving you a tiny, tiny little box to look at each shock wave with, which is great if you wanna look at kinetic processes, but if you wanna know global processes, you're a bit out of luck and you might need to, yeah, use the model or, um, yeah, <laughs> or do a cross-scale spacecraft where you put MMS inside a cluster and, and, and have some fun with even more multi-scale stuff. But that's a bit of a pipe dream, I think. <laughs> Maybe one day. Yeah, yeah, Martin just said, sounds like we need a cross-scale mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we've got another question from Johnny Ray. Um, really nice talk, very much enjoyed it. You mentioned that there were some really good missions to do shock physics with. So what mission for shock physics would you like to see next? Oh, same question. So cross-scale mission, is that what you think? Uh, I would definitely say cross-scale, cross, cross scale, yeah. Um, so if you can get the kinetic scale physics in the same place as the, the sort of the fluid scale, global scale um, uh, model, uh, it really helps in trying to put things into context. Um, cause it's all very well saying, yeah, you have this, this, this minute scale, um, MMS stuff over here and you have this great fluid scale or ion kinetic scale stuff with cluster over here, but let's put them together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you can mitigate some of the issues, of not having that with simulations and so on, but, um, if we can dream, we can go for cross scale. Yeah. Fingers crossed. We'll see that in the next few years. Um, okay, are there any more questions? We've got about five minutes left. I think everyone's feeling a bit shy today. Oh, we've got another one um, from Joel Abraham. Great talk. If I recollect, you showed distribution of solar wind upstream and how it evolved with shock front. Does the distribution become more Maxwellian or Kappa after passing through the shock? Uh, so this is with regards to this kind of electron acceleration. Um, so in theory, when you cross the shock wave, you should be giving every um, particle, every electron, um, some amount of extra energy based on the cross shock potential um, or in this sort of more modern approach based on every time it crosses an electric field spike. Um, so that kind of pushes out your kappa distribution, your, your tails outwards and fills them in in the middle with the, um, with the with this flat top distribution you get from further particle scattering and so on. Um, what exactly ends up happening to the, the, the sort of the heavy tail halo electrons um, is still a thing that, that that's sort of ongoing on research. So, um, seeing how the kappa distribution or something is, is, is still very much of interest, I think. Um, but yeah, you, 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 you're also expecting some kind of diffusive shock acceleration stuff to kind of push out your tails into to, um, heavier, having some kind of heavy tail, heavier tailed, um, very, very high energy population as well on your power law. Um, so I think it should be should be wider after you cross the shock. But um, what happens, I suppose, at the intermediate uh, energies is still still ongoing. <laughs> okay, great. I hope that answered your question, Joel. Um, any other questions? Um, if not, because we're almost at. 12. Um, I think we can wrap up there. So thank you once again, Imogen. That was a really, really interesting seminar. 